so my name is Nico. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I currently work at Meta uh, building maps for uh, the Reality Labs organization, which works through in AR and VR. Uh, previously, I've been a director of engineering and, and head of data visualization at Uber, uh, where a few uh, awesome open source work ha has been out from like DECGL and Kepler GL um, and, and others. Um, and before that, I used to work at Twitter and I did data visualizations, mostly um, working on visual narratives for how um, different events were lived on Twitter, like the Oscars or any other sort of like uh, a mass event. Um, here's a picture of me at the Meta office um, in front of, a, of an artwork called Manhattan Memories Map, uh, which was uh, produced by the um, studio Maravillas. And my interests in general are in data visualization, computer graphics, computational design, mathematical art, and digital fabrication. Um, so let's talk about maps. Maps, uh, we all know them as a graphic representation of the physical space, you know, the stuff that we live around or in. Uh, we want to map it to a scale where we can browse it, we can hold it in our hand, we can uh, fulfill the needs of uh, orientation, navigation, and exploration of things around us. That's what maps are. Um, but maps have been around for quite a few years. Like, you know, this example is about 5,000 years ago. Um, and it's taken from the book, uh, The Story of Art, which I highly recommend. Um, and uh, it's the tomb of Nema Amun. Um, and what's interesting about this artwork that you can find in the tomb is that it, it has a methodology that is very similar to mapping. And it has a methodology that is also very similar to sort of like dimensionality reduction, where um, you want to like basically take in three-dimensional objects and map them into two-dimensional space, but you want to choose your two dimensions in a way that you have most of the information packed in those two dimensions. So you don't just go ahead and flatly uh, project it into some axes. So in this case, you can see this work happening, for example, with the trees. The trees are being looked at from the side. Even if we're looking from above the pool, the trees are looked from the side because that's the angle where we can get the most information from those trees. Um, the pool is seen from above because if we saw it from the side, we would not get as much information as seeing it from above. And the feature looked at from the side because it is the angle and the two dimensions that convey the most information for each one of these elements. So this person was really practicing a really interesting projection method by object where the level of dimensions that were used in the dimensionality reduction was, was conveying the most of the information at each time. And they had a lot of consistency. If you look at a lot of the, the Egyptian sort of like artwork, there's a lot of consistency with this. We try to, to reduce the dimensions, but, but keep the dimensions that have most of the information in them. So how maps work? Uh, there's three main elements for maps. There's scaling, projections, and symbols. Symbols translated directly from you know, data visualization work. Um, the world from, you know, mapping visual marks and channels over to, to data. And um, on the scale, you know, first of all, we want, we want the map to have some form of scale because we want to be able to hold the map in our hands. We want to be able to browse the map, but also because at different scales, we get to see uh, different visual features from a map. Um, and so we can, we can see the topology of, of the map. We can see the topology of the road networks, we can see how land use is, is, is being um, utilized. And so um, the scale, it provides like um, different ways of aggregating data and different ways of finding different visual patterns within the map. Um, another type of scale, for example, is um, for indoor maps. So we the maps not only have to be happening outdoors, maps can happen indoors. They're pretty useful, for example, for well, VR, like we might need maps in VR to be able to localize ourselves so that we can track ourselves as we move around. Uh, like the most of these devices have six degree of freedom um, of, for, for movement. Um, we might wanna map our house because we wanna use AR to set some furniture in our house and figure out how it looks like. Um, you know, we might wanna map our house because we wanna augment it with digital objects um, that are, you know, uh, anchored on the walls and, and other places. So 
the scaling for mapping also works and maps are not only outdoors. Um, finally, I wanted to leave you with this thought on scaling, which is that like, I do believe that there's a little bit of a change within human computer interaction techniques happening due to some of the, the VR work. And this is one of them, right? Like, you know, we're used to seeing maps as physical objects in 2D flat space, or looking at maps as like, you know, on our mobile device where we can zoom in and out. But maps here can take a completely different, more immersive uh, sort of like um, role where we can have tabletop maps uh, as we're sitting at the table and then we can dynamically move and change the actual scaling for the map and we can be in the map as well, exploring different details of, of locale where we are, you know, located. And so th this is like pausing for me, like lots of new questions of how to interact with maps um, and how to use maps for exploration um, that, you know, before were probably not possible because we were using different kinds of computers. So the second piece is projections. And you might ask yourself why there are so many map projections. And the problem with map projections is that when you translate from 3D space over to 2D space, you need to make some trade-offs and some compromises. Usually these trade-offs and compromises are around area and preservation of angles, or we call conformality. And so, for example, this is a perfectly normal, quote unquote, like, map projection, the Mercator projection, you'd think it's great, but then if you are trying to compare areas for different objects, you see how they get really distorted, right? So this projection is great because it preserves angles, but it does really bad at preserving areas. And so you get a lot of these sort of like distortions or even visual illusions for, for different sizes of, of things. Um, so the conformal projection, which is which is really good, can be can be seen with this what we call the Tissot indicatrix. So imagine that you kind of like draw circles on top of the globe, um, all of the same radius, and now you unfold the globe into your Mercator projection. So this is how the circles would look like, the disks would look like. So basically, the disks remain disks. So circles remain circles, which means that angles remain the same angles. However, the areas of the disks are changing as you're moving up and down the ladder of, of latitude. And so and so like this this shows you the level of distortion and the type of distortion that happens within this map projection. Now here is a good projection, pun intended. Um, it's a it's a projection that is supposed to preserve both um, area uh, a lot better. And what you can see here is there's a, a thing that's creeping in, which is the fact that we need to make more cuts into the map. If we wanna be preserving you know, angles to some extent and also be preserving area to some extent, then suddenly we need to be slicing the, the projection and the, and the paper a little bit more as we stretched it on the surface, um, which gives us this sort of like interesting sort of trifecta or, or, or interesting sort of dynamic across these different constraints of map projections. On um, We have this triangle, I'll explain what it is. On the bottom left, the vertex on the bottom left are all projections that are equal area. So if you want it to be 100% equal area, you go to the bottom left. Um, if you wanted to preserve angles, uh, you know, in per perfection, you would go to the Mercator projection, which is at the bottom right. Now, what happens if you want to preserve some area and some angle and like not be super distorted in both, then you start moving up. And as you move up, you see that we need to do more interrupts and cuts to that paper. Similar to what, you know, when you're peeling an orange, and if you were to put it on the table, you really need to sort of create all these different cuts on the on the on the skin of the um, orange. And um, and so when you get to there is a place that is the 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 top vertex um, where you can find maps that are both equal area and conformal maps. Um, a, which is called Mirahiral Projections. And so this is a paper that Jörg van Wyck um, published more than 20 years ago with a lot of really interesting set of map projections that both preserve area and um, angles at the expense of creating lots of cuts. So how does this work? Let me quickly walk you through the project. Hopefully everything works. Um, so this is live projects have been, been coding in WebGL. The idea behind it is you have a mesh 
uh, which is a spherical mesh. Um, in this case, it's a graticule mesh. So it's divided by latitude and longitudes. And then you create many, 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 many um, uh, surfaces in the mesh, like so you subdivide it multiple times. And then you assign different weights to the edges of the mesh so that you can create cuts um, and then unfold, unfolded, uh, mimicking some sort of map projection. So in this case, we're preserving both area and angle, but we're creating all these different cuts at the longitude level, right? Um, we can also kind of mimic other common map projections similar to the equirectangular map projection, or if we were to separate into two map hemispheres, we could do that too. But since we have that sort of like finer grain um, ability, we can also cut and leave like land in one piece and then cut through, through water as well. And now we can start getting creative with this methodology. We can get a mesh that is not a graticule mesh, but we can, for example, get a tetrahedron and start subdividing the triangles of the tetrahedron into a sphere. And then we can assign weights in a way that sort of like in a fractal way um, unfolds the mesh. And so now we have, like you can see the four faces of the tetrahedron um, being subdivided multiple times. You could do this with sort of like a cube as well. So you can see the six faces of the cube with this recursive subdivision. You can also kind of like change the center of the map as well if you wanted to, to the center for the, for the projection to be somewhere else. And then finally, um, what Van Wick did was also look at like the actual platonic solids. So if you were to get a cube and you wanted to find cuts in that cube that don't cut the land, how would you position and project your map on top of the cube? And so these are some solutions for a cube. This is a solution for octahedron, for example. Um, this is a solution for a dodecahedron, which unfortunately does cut some land, but it tries to, to minimize it. And then we have a bit more sort of like complex uh, shapes around our comedian solids and others that you can you can take a look at. But that's the main idea. So back to the presentation. Um, the idea is we start with a mesh, we create the weights, and then we unfold the mesh to create these sort of visualizations. So finally, I want to chat a little bit about symbols. So this is taken from Jacques Bertin's uh, semiology of graphics. Uh, where you know you find a categorization of data into you know ordinal, quantitative, categorical, and then you try to map those and rank them with the vi different visual marks and channels, which are the ones that are here. And you can use those in maps as well, right? This is a, a very classic uh, a map of Jon Snow where we're using dots or different marks to mark uh, deaths and and also mark where the water is being pumped and create that sort of co visual correlation. Uh, between water and, and cholera. Um, there's these beautiful maps by Erica Fisher on sort of like the different local versus tourists and different color encoding or different color encoding for different ethnicity at different cities, um, which really um, show the richness of the humanity living in, in each one of these places. Um, this one is a really interesting one uh, because it's a multivariate sort of analysis on a map also taken from semiology of graphics, um, where you're mapping the size of the symbol to someone's height, you're mapping the color of the symbol to the color of the hair of that person, and you're mapping the shape of the symbol to the cephalic index. And so you can quickly do multivariate queries within the map themselves um, and, and get some interesting insights. Uh, we've talked about choropleth maps, uh, so I actually quickly uh, jump over these, but we're in this case using the actual shape of the county or the state and then coloring that, and that's our visual attribute. Um, then we can start playing with the shape or the size of that county or state, and so we can start talking about cartograms. Um, these are really good cartograms that Noah Bellman sort of like implemented in JavaScript from different uh, newspapers that they've been using them for, for the US. Um, there is cartograms like uh, Dorling cartograms where um, instead of preserving the actual position for that state, you can move it around a little bit so it doesn't superpose um, or overlap with other symbols. Um, and you get these really beautiful shapes of the state that are still very recognizable, but at the same time um, uh, uh, positioned in the way that there's no overlapping. Um, and you know, classic flow maps like the, the Minard uh, uh, Napoleon March uh, map, which is like a really good example of a flow map 
um, uh, mapping the, the line thickness with the size of the army. Um, flow maps has also been revisited quite a bit in the literature through edge bundling techniques. This one is visualizing different uh, uh, trips by a plane and uh, the paths are being bundled by in, in the edges. Um, and then finally, what we want to end with is this sort of like vector field map where we're using symbols to encode wind direction, speed, and temperature with color. Uh, but you can also use sort of like particles for it. So in this case, we can use the vector fields for the wind and simulate that by throwing some particles on top. Um, but also we can use the symbols of, of the arrows to know at each point what the wind speed and uh, and temperature and, and direction is. And if we change the hour of the day with the slider, that um, sort of like will we'll change the arrows and then the the uh, dots or the particles will sort of like reposition themselves to create new vortices and, and other interesting phenomena that cannot be seen with this sort of grid of, of, um, of arrows. So uh, just to wrap it up, um, you know, Kind of recalling some of Taftist's uh, principles for analytical design, I'd say like still though think about your audience because there's some of these that might get more important than others if you're trying to create a functional map that can be explored or if you're trying to create a data art like you know for example content counts most of all. I don't know if I want my map to look great in my living room. I may not care as much what data set I'm visualizing, but I do care about the aesthetics of the map. But all of these count, and um, and so would make sure to maybe have a checklist of some of these um, before you you start or while you're working on your map. Um, and that's all. I feel like I raced through the slides, but thank you so much. <laughs>